This is section two, the opening of Japan and radical reform to 1894 of History 370, Modern East Asia. Our objectives in this section are to understand the traditional social and political order of Japan, to understand why Japan was able to adjust quickly to the challenge of the West, and to understand what Japan adapted from the West and why. So just as with China, Japan had particular geographic features that encourage division and disunity. And Japan would actually have a less centralized government until the 19th century and the Meiji Restoration, which is itself a kind of reaction to the West. So these geographic uh, circumstances that helped encourage this kind of division, one of the big ones is Japan is very mountainous, right? As you can see from this picture, uh, you can see mountains in the background, you can see a lot of mountainous territory, and um, you can see that they're trying to grow rice on a hillside there. So Japan has a lot of mountains, and while that does allow for some cultural spreading, it's fairly easy to walk over mountains. On the other hand, in contrast, it's very hard to lead an army over mountains and conquer the people um, over those mountains. So Japan, like China, is going to have uh, geographic features that encourage division, in this case, this kind of mountainous terrain. Another geographic feature that is going to help encourage division in some important ways are islands. Japan will be made up of multiple islands. There's four, will eventually be four main islands. Um, but just being an island nation, right, you're going to have divisions between the, di the groups of people who develop on these different islands, right? And of course, anytime you have water separating uh, pieces of territory, that makes administration, it makes conquest, it means um, that it's going to be difficult to kind of hold that together into one government. So on one side, islands could help lead to division. At the same time, though, these islands will also, in a, in a kind of curious way, encourage unity because Japan is going to be by, of course, China. And so at times, right, the Japanese will develop a sense of unity in reaction to Chinese unity. So there's a sense, oh, there's these Chinese people and they're, and then, of course, there's also these Korean people and they're different from us. Japanese people. And that kind of recognition of difference will help build a kind of cultural unity among Japanese people, which will eventually help lead to a political unity. So Japan, even though it has this kind of division into islands and it's, it's divided by mountains, that will lead to a kind of political uh, disunity. It will not be as centralized as China until the 19th century. However, it does lead to a kind of cultural unity where Japanese people will still see people on these other islands of Japan uh, across the mountain valleys and so forth as still sharing a kind of culture that makes them different from say the Chinese people or the Korean people they're encountering. Similarly, this, this island geography is very important because Japan will be far enough away from China that it is hard to invade Japan. In the 13th century, under the Yuan dynasty, the, the Mongol dynasty, there will be two attempts to invade Japan. They both fail owing to the kamikaze, the divine winds. Basically, uh, some typhoons will hit the Mongol invasion force, which the Japanese will say, oh, you know, we're the land of the gods. That's why the gods intervene to protect our islands. So because of that security, that the ocean provides, that, the, uh, that being an island nation provides, Japan is going to be able to borrow more freely with China and adapt that borrowing creatively without feeling threatened by China in the same way that, say, Korea might. And you can see this in just the fact that Japan will claim to have an emperor. The Japanese will borrow the word emperor from China and they will say that their monarch, their ruler, is an emperor. And I want to stress they're using the exact same Chinese characters, right? Japan will also borrow Chinese writing. So this is kind of astounding when you think about it, because remember, I had said in an earlier section that Chinese believed that there was only one emperor, right? There's only one son of heaven. There's only one intermediary between heaven and earth. And he 
was in China. But the Japanese will borrow that idea of the emperor, will claim publicly to the Chinese that they have an emperor, and the Chinese don't like it, but there's nothing much they can do about it because Japan is an island nation safe um, across the sea. But again, one thing I have to stress, and this is what makes this history so interesting and what I think makes Japan interesting is that they creatively borrow, they creatively adapt. They're not copycats who just, just copy anything from someone else. They take freely and adapt freely from other cultures. So you may recall that the Chinese emperor claimed that he ruled and his dynasty and his family ruled through having the mandate of heaven and that you could change dynasties. And you may recall, I talked about how we divide Chinese history into dynasties, right? There's the, um, uh, the, the Ming dynasty we mentioned, the Yuan dynasty before it, and then the Qing dynasty uh, after that as the last dynasty. In Japan, you can't divide Japanese history that way because they only have one dynasty. There's only been one family that rules Japan, theoretically. Right, they don't. That was we'll see. The emperor often doesn't actually rule himself. But the key thing I want to make, key point I want to make here is we don't Jap divide Japan into dynasties for historical purpose be purposes because there's only been one dynasty. Now you may say, well, wait a second, how does that work? Why do they only have one dynasty? Well, as I said, the Chinese emperor claimed to rule through the mandate of heaven. That's why he was emperor. Heaven chose me because my family is moral. In Japan, the Japanese emperor ruled because he was supposed to be descendant of Amaterasu, the sun goddess. Now, I keep saying he because that's the majority of emperors, and, and legally now only a man can be the Japanese emperor. Uh, there were a few Japanese female empresses, though. I, I want to stress that. But for the, I'm just going to generally say he because the vast majority of the emperors were men. But curiously enough, their claim to be emperors had to do with the fact that they were believed to be the descendants of Amaterasu, the sun goddess. And so oftentimes the Japanese emperor was presented in a maternal way. Now, and that is why, for example, the Japanese flag has a sun on it. And you can see how the Japanese would kind of tweak the, the Chinese. Um, because one thing that the one Japanese emperor did was he wrote to the Chinese emperor and he said, from the land of the rising sun, which is what Japan, uh, its technical name is, um, if you look at the Chinese characters, to the land of the setting sun, which the Chinese emperor did not much like. Now, one thing that will happen, though, and this again goes to this point, why is there only one dynasty in Japan? The Japanese emperors will soon lose power to the aristocrats, right? I won't go into detail about how this happens, but the Japanese emperors will soon essentially become puppets of aristocratic factions. Now, you may say, well, wait a second, why don't you just overthrow the emperor and become emperor yourself? That's what they did in China, right? In China, if you wanted to actually have power, you would overthrow the emperor and take power for yourself. But remember, that doesn't work in Japan because they don't believe in the mandate of heaven in the same way the Chinese do. In China, anyone, even a peasant, remember the Ming dynasty founder was a peasant, could, if they were successful, overthrow the dynasty and claim that they now had the mandate of heaven. But in Japan, you cannot do that. A peasant cannot overthrow the government and claim to have the mandate of heaven because that peasant cannot claim to be the descendant of Amaterasu, the sun goddess. Now, the Japanese believed in the mandate of heaven. They just argued that the um, emperors had it and they were so awesome, they would never lose it. Right? And this is why, again, in, in China, you have to refer to dynastic names in Japan. Uh, usually, you divide up historical periods by the name of the city that the emperor ruled from or the, where the shoguns, who I will introduce later, ruled from. But the key thing here is you cannot, if you're an aristocrat or a peasant or whoever, you cannot replace the emperor and claim that you are now emperor. You have to rule through the emperor. Right? You have to rule through the emperors. So the Japanese emperor, even though he has the same title as the Chinese emperor, unlike the Chinese emperor, will often actually have very little political power. Right? Will often have very little political power. And you may recall that we talked about how the Chinese emperor has political and religious power, the Japanese emperor will generally only have religious power. Now, when you think of Japanese rule, you often think of the samurai, and you'll notice I haven't mentioned them yet. And I'm going to talk, uh, kind of set up things now so we can start talking about them.
So these aristocrats, their power is based on the emperor's power, right? They use him as a puppet. They get their legitimacy through him. They have to work through him if there's a policy they want to implement. So they want to stay in the capital. They want to stay in the capital. And I don't give you the capital name because it was always changing in, in uh, ancient Japan. But they want to stay in the capital close to the emperor because that's where their power came from. So they hired people to guard their tax-free lands in the provinces, right? They lived in the capital, but their power base, their land, was in the provinces. And as aristocrats, they didn't have to pay taxes on that land. So they want to stay in the capital, but, you know, if you just stay in the capital and you're not on your land, eventually someone will come in and take over your land. So they had to hire people to guard their tax-free lands in the provinces. And eventually those people came to be known as samurai. A samurai literally means those who serve, but their major job in this early period was serving those aristocrats by guarding and managing their lands for them. And aristocrats at times would use their samurai to fight each other, to uh, try and gain political power, right? The aristocrats would be using these samurai as kind of pawns in a political game. But eventually, the samurai d developed the sense, they're like, you know what? We're the guys with the swords. We're the guys who are good at fighting. Why don't we work together and seize power from the aristocrats? Now, I'm oversimplifying things. But what ends up happening is the samurai develop a sense of class consciousness that, hey, we are this group of people called samurai, those who serve, meaning those who serve militarily. Let's just take power from the aristocrats, and then we'll be in charge. And this leads to the rise of what is called the shogun. Now, shogun simply means general, but the shogun is going to become an important political figure as leader of the samurai, essentially. Right? The shogun, in a, in a sense, can be thought of as the leader of the samurai class. And basically what develops then uh, is this system in which the Japanese emperor performs a religious role performs various rituals to the gods to keep them happy, to keep everything running smoothly in a cosmic sense. And he uses that legitimacy as emperor, as the descendant of Amaterasu, to appoint the strongest warrior as shogun. And that's his one political role to say, okay, this samurai warrior is very powerful. He has the loyalty of a lot of other samurai. I'm going to use my legitimacy as the descendant of Amaterasu to say that this guy is the political leader of Japan. And the shogun will dominate Japanese politics for hundreds of years. Now there will be differing what we call shogunates. A shogunate is a reference to the shogunal government. There will be one in the city of Kamakura and then another one later on in the city of Ashikaga. That's where they're, they're centered. And this system works really well for hundreds of years keeping the peace in Japan. However, in the mid-15th century, this system will break down. And essentially what will happen is there's no one warrior who can keep everyone else in line. There's no single powerful warrior for the emperor to appoint as shogun. And we refer to the results of this breakdown of this system as the Sengoku. Um, sen means war. Goku means country. So it means country at war. And you may remember I talked about how China is called Zhongguo, meaning middle kingdom. Goku is the pronunciation of Guo for Japanese people. It's the same character, meaning country. So it's a time of country at war. I don't expect you remember these exact years, but I just want to highlight this period lasted from the middle of the 15th century to the early 17th century. So, you know, you think of the American Civil War, it lasted five years, and there were two sides, right? The Union and the Confederacy. The Japanese Civil Wars last from the middle 15th century to the early 17th century. And I chose this image in particular because you'll see that there's a group of samurai on the left, a group of samurai on the right who are fighting each other, but there's also a third group in the middle who are apparently allies of one group of samurai. And those guys are Buddhist monks. So to make things even more complex in this time period, you also have monks who are fighting. Uh, they, had, uh, they were called the teeth and claws of the Buddha. Um, but you had these warrior monks who were also involved uh, in this fighting. So this is a very serious uh, civil war. And to, to further hammer home how complex this was, how, how difficult the situation was, and how there is this tendency towards division and disunity, Japan was broken up into over 200 domains. 
And these are kind of like, if you're into medieval history, these would be called like fiefs or something like that. But they're basically pieces of territory ruled by a daimyo. Daimyo literally means great name. Dai means big, myo means name. So you had Japan divided up into over 200 daimyo, each of whom could theoretically become shogun. So as I said earlier, when we have this American Civil War, which you have, um, you know, two sides, the Union and the Confederacy, the Japanese Civil War that lasts, you know, almost 150 years has over 200 sides. Making th And these guys are all fighting it out. In addition, to make things, uh, all of them want to unite Japan and be named Shogun. Now, all these daimyo were served by samurai, these military warriors, who theoretically are loyal. Remember, the name itself means those who serve. And if you look at the uh, kind of um, the popular image of samurai, they're these these loyal people who would never, uh, who would you know, who would fight to the death for their lord, who would who would never think of betraying them. And this is just absolutely false. Uh, the samurai were supposed to be loyal, but often were not. So daimyo had two big fears. They, in their effort to unite Japan and be named shogun, they were afraid of internal rebellion. They were afraid that if they did not keep all their samurai happy, one of them might rebel and kill them. And to give you an example, the person who almost became shogun, a man named Odo Nobunaga, who you won't, we won't, you don't have to remember his name. He, that's exactly what happened to him. He had actually conquered most of Japan, had control of the emperor, was on his way to becoming um, named shogun. But one of his own samurai generals rebelled and uh tried to kill him and uh, Obu Nobunaga actually committed suicide so he wouldn't suffer the shame of being killed by his own vassal. And of course, in addition, they're also concerned about another daimyo invading them. So these daimyo, there, there's a lot of them. They all want to unite Japan and be named Shogun. They're also, at the same time, they're afraid that the samurai within their uh, domain might rebel. And they're also afraid that another larger domain might invade and destroy them. And because of the nature of this course, I can't go too much into this, but to make things even more complex, I already talked about how you have Buddhist um, warrior monks running around trying to do their thing. There's also Catholic missionaries and like Catholic daimyo and Catholic samurai. And the Portuguese show up with the missionaries uh, and start bringing in guns to Japan. So the, uh, the Japanese will actually start learning how to use like matchlock guns from Europe and will actually learn to use them very, very effectively. So this is a really, really complex situation. And it looks like, and I mean, you know, remember this takes over 150 years. It's questionable, you know, if you're living this time period, will anyone ever be able to unify Japan?